Praise the Lord, guys. Good to see you folks. Uh, what a great worship set that was. And uh, we're going to continue in our study through the book of Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 12. I know last week we announced, uh, we had an announcement on uh, our Sunday morning service that we're looking for volunteers, guys, in all areas of the ministry. So uh, if you'd like to help out, uh, uh, sound, praise and worship, administration, putting up street signs, AV, Sunday school, whatever it might be, uh, we could use your help. So uh, pray about that and uh, let us know if you'd like to participate. But in Hebrews 12, we come to a place in Scripture that many, or at least some, may not enjoy. It's a place in Scripture where the Lord speaks of discipline. Ooh, discipline, what a heavy word, yeah. We think about we had parents who were disciplinarians. We had school administrators who were disciplinarians. We had aunts and uncles, maybe, maybe even neighbors before they give you a, a swift kick in the pants, you know, if you acted up and stuff like that. But, you know, a lot of it was all in love and uh, uh I'd like to begin, actually, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Why don't we read through the first uh, uh, four verses first. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, that you might not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. I think the, the, the author of uh, Hebrews, the Holy Spirit, really uh, uh, is uh, picking up the, the, the study right here in uh, verse 3. Consider him who endured such hostility that you might not grow weary and lose heart. It seemed that the, those in the church, within the church, because of persecution, because of hard times, uh, they were growing weary. And, you know, many were tempted to kind of reject their newfound faith in Jesus Christ and kind of just fade back into the scene, fade back into the woodwork of the religious goings-on with the uh, uh, the Hebrew religion, you know, going to church, going to temple and bringing your offering and kind of coming and going, not too dangerous, not too radical for the Roman government, pretty benign. In other words, the people were kind of docile and no trouble. Jesus came really to shake up the world, and he began with his uh, disciples, and uh, as uh, the Spirit was poured out, the world really was turned upside down as people were getting radically saved and people were getting radical for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know prayed earlier was uh, uh, that we would let our light shine. You know, we as uh, uh, believers in Jesus Christ, the light of the love of the Lord would shine forth from our hearts and lives. And this is exactly what was going on. And yet, you know, when you move forward in the Lord, a lot of times you're going to face the persecution. You're going to face the hard times. You're going to face the trials and tribulations. So he says, hey, don't grow weary and lose heart because of this hostility by those sinners are, are against, really against the Lord and against uh, his church. Uh, he says, you have not resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you know that uh, uh, shedding blood, you know, is really something that is going on around the world. As Christians live and die for the name of Jesus Christ every, each and every day, guys, you know, you, you think that you, we have a tough year where we have a little bit of uh, uh, disparaging remarks, a little bit of uh, chastisement, a little bit of ignorance, and a little bit of, put, of being put aside by the community or by the people in lar uh, at large. Or people might just say, oh, the guy's a little weird. He's a Christian, you know. <laughs> and those are, those are the ways, uh, uh, the response you might have. But we have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. And you have... Uh, uh, and you have forgotten the exhortation, verse 5, which was, which was addressed to his sons. My son, do not right, uh, regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. And you know, uh, here, uh, here is some, I think, uh, 
Uh, let's read 6 to 4. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son whom he receives. And when some of, uh, uh, some of us think of discipline, we don't have the fondest memories again. We may recall being disciplined by parents or teachers. You might remember someone wielding a large stick. I don't know, that was, uh, corporal punishment was allowed in school before. You know, they could hit you with a stick. <laughs> In our intermediate school, the PE teacher had a large paddle, uh, which, uh, which we came to know as the Board of Education. Uh, it seems to have brought tears to even the most toughest of guys, you know, as he took them into the, the, um, um, the locker room and, and told them, hey, you're going to get the Board of Education, and whack, you could hear that whack coming, and uh, the guys came out, you know, just feeling the, the pain of that discipline. But here in this verse, is we we automatically default to the thought of discipline as punishment. A lot of us, again, think of the physical paddling, the physical beating. You know, you might have had the, the yardstick, you might have had the belt, the hairbrush, you might have had the, uh, uh, the clothes hanger, whatever it was, but the discipline of the Lord is in the Greek translated a little differently here in chapter 13, guys. It literally speaks of to train children to chasten, as the Webster uh, uses, the Webster Dictionary uses, literally to chain, train children is the thought. And you, you can kind of think that, you know, although we hear of some real horror stories about how parents treat little children, in, in general, most of the part, if parents are tender towards the little kids. So the, the Lord is not uh, wielding a big stick as to beat the sin or silliness out of us. Out of us. But really, as a tender, loving, heavenly Father, bringing instruct, instruction and correction. And uh, you, may th you may say that I'm pretty old for this, but we, we're never too old, uh, as his desire is that we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The thought again, no matter how old we are physically, how old we are in the Lord, or how mature we think we're in the Lord, uh, the thought again is instructing children to train children with graciousness and with firmness. You know, you can be gracious, you can be firm, but loving. And this is the Father that we serve, instructing children. The word scourging he uses in verse 6 is, pretty, uh, uh, is a pretty harsh word, guys. It does speak of a scourge of cords or thongs, some weighted with bone, bone fragments or even pieces of lead or metal to help inflict excruciating pain and physical flaying open of the skin and the flesh. I think this is what is portrayed at the crucifixion of Jesus, guys. There was a scourging with this cat of nine tails uh, uh, embedded into the ends of the thongs were the pieces of bone or the pieces of metal that really opened up his flesh. But here uh, in verse 6, it's used as a metaphor or a, physical, uh, a figure of speech to get the attention of the reader. And again, the Spirit was really trying to get attention of, uh, of those that he wrote to because they were really in the danger of forsaking their newfound relationship in Jesus Christ and going back to that old way. It's safe at the temple. It's safe going in on the feast days. It's safe to bring your offering. It's safe not to make waves out there in the world, you know. And uh, in, in other words, it's a safe thing. And, you know, we're not going to get persecuted. The Romans aren't going to come down on us, you know. And some of uh, uh, some Scholars think that this letter was addressed to those in Jerusalem or those in Rome. And I really think that uh, because Jerusalem was in that place of really getting hard treatment by Rome, and in fact, Rome would help uh, lay siege to Jerusalem. And uh, eventually in 70 AD, the walls of Jerusalem were broken down and Rome came in and just destroyed the city. They destroyed the temple, they destroyed the buildings, they took all the gold, all the good stuff. And the people were scattered uh, for their faith uh, in God. You know, whether they were uh, uh, religious Jews or Christians, I think they took the hard brunt of the Roman uh, Empire. The heavy boot of Rome came down upon us. But here, again, it's a metaphor for a figure of speech to get the attention of the reader. Again, the, the Lord is trying to get the attention of those saying, hey, don't go back. Don't go back into the world. Don't, don't lay back where it's safe where it's comfortable. Because at times, hey, being a Christian is not comfortable at all. Being at times is you push to the edge, you push to the forefront, you push to that place of uh, 
man, you weary. You, oh, you bust up. You, you. I, I heard one of the pastors saying that uh, he was laying in the fetal position on the bed, you know, just kind of crying out to the Lord during those difficult times. And, you know, all, although everything seemed so perfect on the outside and so good on the outside, you know, he was just uh, cuddled up like a little child crying out to the Father, hey, you know, what's going on? And, you know, the, the things that we as individual believers go through, uh, these are the things that the Spirit was trying to address. In 7 to 10, he says, "For It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you just as with sons. For what son is uh, there whom a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which you are all have become partakers, then you are illeg illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had... Uh, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them, but he dis disciplines us for our good, that we might share in his holiness. See, we had earthly fathers that tried to beat the, all, the, all the junk out of us, all the rascalness out of us, all the bad things, you know. You might, you might have been a bad kid. I don't know. You might have been a shoplifter. You might have been, you know, uh, abusing drugs or alcohol or whatever it might have been. You might have been cutting out from school and, you know, your father wanted to beat it out of you. But here the Heavenly Father, he disciplines us for our good that we might share in his holiness. It's, it's not something that he's beating us. We're getting beat up because it's shame for the family. We're not getting beat up because they want us to be good. But the Lord disciplines us that we might share in his holiness. We are being set apart for him, guys. We are being made holy. We are being as those uh, day by day being set apart a little bit more, a little bit more for his use and for his glory. And can you think about that? That never ends. It never ends. No matter how old we are in the Lord, how far we've come, we're not, we're not here to make three tabernacles and just camp out and hang out and worship the Lord. But God is pushing us and, and taking us further and further and pushing that envelope to where hey, we, we got to cry out to him. We got to trust him. It's him because we can't do it on our own. We, can't, we cannot handle, you know. It's he, he is the one. Uh, that, that gives us the grace and the strength and the mercy to get through it. Otherwise, you know, it's impossible. If, if we could do it in, his, uh, in our flesh, hey, why did he have to die for us? If we could do it on our own, why did he have to uh, be crucified on our benefit? If we could do it on our own, what good is he? You know, we can just uh, say, hey, I'll be good and be done with, <coughs> uh, done with it. But the discipline or correction we go through as a child of God is really for our good. In fact, the word good is an interesting word. It's literally to bring together, to be profitable. To be brought together for the common good, it's expedient, it's good, and profitable. In my New American Standard Bible, it's used only two times in the entire New Testament, this word good, that's, as it's translated here. Uh, here in verse 10 and in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each one of us has given us, uh, the Lord has given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good of who? The common good of the entirety of the body of Christ, the common good of the entirety of the world that we live in and we minister to in. Uh, minister to and the common good as we come together to worship the Lord you see um, the book of Hebrews really tries to prove and to reason with those believers that were in the place of kind of saying yeah I'm gonna, I gotta kick back I just gotta lay low I just gotta relax I gotta I, I, I did a lot all this time but now it's, it's he's saying that Hey, this, these are all for the common good of those around you. This is for the common good, not only for yourself, <coughs> but for the entirety of the com co uh, community around you. You see, the good use here is really great, guys. It's profitable for the Lord. It's profitable for his glory. And it's profitable for all our good, all of our benefit. You know, it's good for us, guys, because, we, you know, we're going to be those that are... Uh, uh, conformed into his image, those that are being transformed into the goodness 
of Jesus Christ. And we cannot do that laying low. We cannot do that walking without faith. We cannot do that if we can just live and kick back and say, yeah, I'm comfortable, I'm good. You know, I'm good as it is. But, you know, as, we, as, uh, as the Lord pushes us on, as he moves us on, you know, it, it becomes for the good of all. It becomes good for the Lord, for his glory. It's for our good, it's for our benefit, and it's beneficial to those around us. In 11, um, he goes on and he says that all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The discipline or the training up we receive is most of the time really basics, guys. What, what is that? Why is that? You may ask, it's because we forget the basics. We're too smart, eh? Have you ever thought that, hey, I, yeah, I got figure it figured out, Lord. I'm smart, man. I read through the Bible about 12 times already. You know, I'm good. Uh, I, 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 you know, don't you know we're, we're too smart or we're too spiritual? Oh, I'm spiritual already. I'm a giant. But we've got it all figured out. But I've been watching, you know, the, the, the high school baseball championships that are leading up to the state finals. But in the ILH championship game, it was really a hard-hitting game, lots of hits, lots of runs, really a close, good game. Yet at the close of one inning, it was a long, tough inning with a lot of hits and a lot of runs. It was a long one. A pop-up fly to the outfield, the announcer was just ready to say it was the end of the inning. That was the third out. It was, it's the end of the inning. And uh, the ball falls into the fielder's glove and then just pops out. And, you know, the, the guy was just so blown away, the announcer, and everybody was so flabbergasted. The ball just popped right out. The inning continued, and it was a hard stretch for that team. But, you know, what I saw a, a couple plays later, back on the third base side of the field, a line drive down the baseline, the fielder drops down to one knee. He puts his glove down and reaches out with his free hand to snap shut his glove. And uh, I said, Wow textbook just like they taught us when we were little kids hey go down on take take a knee get your glove set up for catch the ball have your free hand to cover cover that glove and snap the glove shut and i said well it just was it was just textbook all the training all the discipline is profitable making right the things of the spirit guys and it's a continual reminder back and forth back and forth He says in 12, that therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather it is healed. Therefore, because of these things, he, got, he says, strengthen the hands that may be or have grown weak or those knees encumbered by bad practice. You know, it might be, uh, it might be like those getting into an accident. They need physical therapy, they need rehab, they need to be retrained. And sometimes when we, uh, we, we in intentionally or unintentionally, we take ourselves out of the game, and we might need a, that rehabbing, we might need uh, the building up of the physical attributes, uh, really uh, our metaphors for our spiritual well-being. And uh, you might uh, make right your relationship, your walk with the Lord is the encouragement. Set your feet straight, set your, your, your paths straight, strengthen the hands that are weak, the limb that may be out of joint, he says, be, be healed. In 14 and 15, he says, pursue peace with all men, the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one's come short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. These verses add practical words of wisdom for all, that we ought to pursue peace, pursue peace, uh, uh, writes the Spirit. Seek the setting apart day by day, rather than bitterness, ask for more of God's grace. We can all use more of God's grace. And you know, there are people that can drive us crazy. There are people that can cause us, to, or things or situation that may cause us to become bitter or to grow bitter in our attitude, but here, you know, the greatest thing is this root of bitterness that springs up, causes trouble, and by it, many might be defiled, and, or many might be touched by this root of bitterness. 
So rather than, um, you know, having this root of bitterness spring up, it's a bad seed, it's a bad fruit, it's a bad result, guys, that bring, that's poisonous to the body of Christ, that's poisonous to those around the world. He says, you know, uh, again, practical words of wisdom, pursue peace, uh, and uh, again, uh, 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 pursue grace, uh, that no root of bitterness springs up. He says in uh, 16 to 24 that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. And that you should know that even afterwards, whether he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it with tears. And if you have not come to the mountain that may, may be touched to, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of the words which sounded uh, was such that those who heard begged that no further word should be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. And if you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, and the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to be sprinkled by the blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Using Esau as an example, guys, he was one who forsook his birthright, in other words, that which was entitled to him, the, the right of birth in God, the right of birth to that newness of life, that right of birth that held all of his future uh, in, in uh, his own hands. Uh, though it was emotionally charged, you know, his, uh, his uh, cry for help, uh, it, it was not able to renew or to reverse the course of his actions and his decisions. And you know, this is a tough verse, guys. When you think about it, is there, a, is there a sin against the spirit that, you know, cannot be reversed? Is there a sin where the guy has sealed his faith for all eternity? There's no turning back. It seems that this was the case with Esau. <coughs> and we know that God desires that none would perish. We know that he desires that all would come to repentance and all come to that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But it was seen that Esau was at that point of the rejection of the Holy Spirit which has become that, that sin that cannot be reversed and uh, uh, reversed the course of his actions and his decisions. It seems that there was no turning back for some. And, you know, I cannot say why we are fortunate here tonight, guys, why we are here tonight practicing right-hearted living, why are we practicing the righteousness, why are we practicing the basics, basics of God, the fellowship, the Bible study, the praise and worship, the prayer, you know, because we, we back down to the basics, we back down to dribbling the ball, we back down to throwing the ball back and forth, we back down to making sure we, we catch that ball in that mid, we're not gonna drop the ball. And we there to, you know, uh, run the race, we there to, uh, uh, to fight the good fight, we there to run to win, you know, that battle. And uh, here, uh, uh, like Mount Zion, guys, uh, you know, he mentions Mount Zion here, or, uh, uh, or Mount Sinai, excuse me. It represented the law. And, you know, it says right here uh, uh, that not even a bee beast could touch the mountain. It would be stoned. It was so terrible, Moses said. I am full of fear and trembling. And that's what the law was like, guys. The law brought fear to us. The law said that, hey, if you get caught, you go in jail. Back in my day, it was hey, you, you either had two choices. You go jail or you can go Vietnam. I had several friends that had that choice. You either go jail or you go Vietnam. And some of them did go to Vietnam. You know, no, nobody wanted to go to jail. But the law says, hey, you're so bad, either you go to jail or you go take a chance at Vietnam. You're gonna have your freedom. You can take your chance, come back in two years if you survive, and you know, uh, everything is uh, expunged, you know, your record. You're gonna be clean. But you know, uh, again, when you think of that mountain, 
Uh, it was filled with darkness. It was filled with gloom. It was filled with whirlwind. And uh, 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 it, it becomes, a, uh, the law is something that becomes written in stone, guys. The law says if you sin, you're getting punished, man. You're getting the full brunt of punishment. There was no wiggle room, and I hate to use that word, but wiggle room, in my estimation, there was no room for grace. There was no room for grace. There was no room for mercy, for the mercy of God to come in and say, oh, my poor son, look at you. I, I know that you're brokenhearted. I know you repented, and I want to be merciful towards you as you call on me. The law pointed out our sin and our shortcomings, and it brought a swift judgment to that sin. And this is what the Spirit was trying to tell the guys. Hey, you go back. You're going to go back under the law. You're going to be held by the law. You're going to be held captive. The consequences of this uh, it called for death. You know, we know that uh, the, the consequences of sin is death, we find in uh, Romans. And, uh, the, the, but the free gift in Jesus Christ was life. That free gift was that mercy, that loving kindness. And I think that's what uh, attracted us because we knew that in our own life, I know many of you guys, uh, you look around, you could never be good enough to merit love, somebody to love you and to forgive you. You could never merit that. I just wasn't good enough, is the cry. Yet Mount Zion calls to mind rather, calls to mind Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know, Jesus is the one full of grace, full of mercy, full of love. And I don't want to call it wiggle room, but I want to really call it he was gracious towards us. He was merciful towards us. In 25 and 26, <coughs> see, <coughs> see to it, <coughs> you, don't, you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if you did not escape when they refused him, who warned them? to turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he is promising yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This verse becomes an appeal for obedience on the part of the reader. It's kind of like a father again. You know, time and time again, I see these verses uh, in the Bible. It's like a loving father trying to reason with his child. Don't go that way. That way is only the disappointment. That way is only emptiness. Sin promises you all the, all the things of fulfillment, but it only brings disappointment. It only brings hurt. It only brings uh, things that bring no satisfaction at all. He brings this appeal of obedience to the part of the reader. No disregarding the warning of, the, the Lord, of God. The consequences would not be favorable. In other words, you know, once we turn from the goodness of God, hey, I don't know, God is always there to try and renew us to repentance. God is always there trying to uh, 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 work on our behalf. But sometimes, you know, our own heart, because it's, we've gotten so easy, we've gotten so to the point where sin is so easy, hey, we, we, uh, we don't want to go back. There's no turning back. There's no turning back from that hardness of heart. We just don't know when that time, when that day, when that hour is. We just don't know, you know, when uh, our time is up. And we just don't know, you know, for the guy that says, oh, I'm going to repent before I go home, uh, before I die. Hey, sometimes there's just no time. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, over the course of this, uh, earlier this week, it seems like there was, we had a murder once a day uh, here in uh, Honolulu. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. And uh, we got a lot of desperados out there. They're robbing the Malasada truck. Can you imagine that? They're robbing the Malasada truck at gunpoint. They're taking people's purses. They're killing people. And, and uh, you know, this is where the heart of the people, some people are at. And, and yet Christ died for these people. He's reasoning with them. He's pleading with them. Uh, 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 you know, turn from your way. The concepts, you know, no disregarding the warnings of God. And, you know, many have heard the warnings, yet have turned away, have disregarded. It's, the, the Father is there uh, uh, pleading for obedience and pleading for a, a heart that would turn toward Him. 
Yet, he says, the, then his vo voice shook the earth, yet now he has promised, saying, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. There's a time coming where both heaven and earth will be shaking, guys. It's a time where the world that the world has never seen, never heard, never thought possible, never imagined. I think in our wildest dreams, uh, it's something so fearful that's going to come down upon this earth. Hopefully, we're all going to be gone. We're going to be in heaven with the Lord by that time. But yet, you know, there's a time coming. And God is uh, not a slow about his promise, but he, he really desires that none would perish, but all come to repentance. He really is desiring. This is why the Spirit is, is calling out. This is why the, re, the Spirit is reasoning with people. Hey, come. You know, there's a time coming. Don't, you know, don't miss the opportunity. Don't miss the, the chance to get your, your ticket stamped that your final destination is heaven. Uh, we're heaven bound. But in 27, he says, and this is the expression, yet once more denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as created things in order that those things which cannot be shaken might be re, uh, may remain. Here's the warning to those whose lives have been turned away by other more comfortable or accommodating scenarios. We There was a movie that we saw a few years ago where an older mother was talking to her son and she was saying that sometimes the devil makes his prison so comfortable. The door is wide open. You can walk right out. Yet things are so comfortable, things are so good, you choose not to. And uh, I forgot what the name of that movie is, but if, we have, if you have been turned away or you know people who have been turned away by more comfortable, more accommodating scenarios, uh, easy on the short run, but when things come to you guys, the payment or the consequences are beyond belief. You know, I think that um, some of the movies cannot uh, really depict the coming uh, tribulation that uh, is coming down. I think uh, David Jeremiah has done a really great uh, scenario on the, the time of the tribulation and what's really coming down during the tribulation period, guys. And, you know, we can, uh, we can see, we can read, we can reread the book of Revelation. We can see that, wow, it's a, tr it's a tremendously terrible time. And... You can think that wow, this is a, this is this is so awesome that we're not going to be there. But we think about those that uh, haven't given their life to the Lord and have uh, given in to the the wiles of the enemy. We can think of that one that comes on the white horse uh, with the bow, and oh, he looks so good. He has all the answers. Uh, we, we can see that one who comes. Uh, he uh, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a like a dragon. You know, we can see all these things coming down. And we can see all, a lot of the people that we've been sharing with, their hearts, their minds, just really seared. Their minds closed because they're not illuminated by the Spirit. Yet we can pray, Lord, pour out your Spirit into their hearts. Pour out their Spirit upon them and alongside of them. Speak to them. And, you know, God has given them the ability to choose and and, and I, I don't know what it was. I don't know what it was with you or with me. You know, there was the time that uh, 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 things were so uh, terrible. Things were so lonely. Things were so uh, unfulfilling that that's when we, we cried out, Hey, God, if you there, hey, save me because, you know, this is life like this is really not worth living. And, you know, God can bring other people uh, to that place where things are so hopeless. Things are so... Uh, uh, bad that they said that hey if you're there please come and rescue me F finishing the chapter 28 and 29 therefore since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken let us show gratitude that we might offer to god an acceptable servants with service with reverence and awe for our god is a consuming fire here he's talking about the uh, offering up our lives as those living sacrifices, guys, holy and pleasing unto Him. We receive, we know that we receive this kingdom that cannot be shaken. 
He says, let us show gratitude. Let us give our very hearts and lives in totality that we might offer to God an acceptable service, service with reverence and with awe. What is that reverence? It's, it, reverence is kind of saying that if hey, we come to you, Lord, with all uh, fear and all uh, 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 reverence and all awe, we come with respect for you. We come not because we're afraid, not because you're the guy with the big stick, but we come because we, we know that you loved us so much and you have all of these great things set up for us. Why shouldn't we give our lives to you? Why shouldn't we, uh, as a child of God, our future and fate are settled forever in the heavens because of this? Why shouldn't we show gratitude and thanks to our holy God, you know, in all things, giving our lives, our hearts and lives over to him? Let, her, let us lift up our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing unto him, our reasonable service of worship. He says, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of the mind. You know, we go, we get back to basics, guys. And we get back to the things of, of worship. We get back to the things of praise. We get back to the things of Bible study and reading. And, you know, I must sound like a broken record to some guys. I, I, I always say, hey, read your Bible. Read your Bible and pray. Get, get to... Call the church, see, see if somebody can come and pick you up, you know. I know you live out of town, but can you get, you know, can you get a ride to church? Can you catch the bus to church? Can you walk to church? Can you get into fellowship? You're almost saying those same things. Are you reading your Bible, you know? Don't catch it on the radio. Radio is good, but it never took the place of going to church, you know. So I think uh, here tonight we're doing the basics here tonight. We, uh, we know that we're receiving this kingdom which cannot be shaken. We're here tonight to offer to God an acceptable servant service with reverence and with awe. God, you're a consuming fire. You're going to come and consume our lives with fire down from heaven and fill us with your power from above. Father God, we do want to thank you, Lord. We can praise you, Lord. We can pray that your spirit might arise in an even greater way and in an even greater amount and in an even greater power, Lord, as we desire more of you and less of us, less of the world, Lord. And we thank you for your great faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you again for your loving kindness and your tender mercies new for us this day. Bless us as we go, Lord. Help us not to forget uh, the, the warnings uh, you give to ourselves and really to the world, Lord, and uh, as uh, you desire us, that we might live as those people, uh, uh, responsible people in the love of Jesus Christ, Lord, worshiping you uh, and serving you with our very hearts and lives. We thank you, Father. We praise you for this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.